The Overlord's Thumb by Robert Silverberg Originally published in Infinity, March 1958 Narrated by Tom Trissel The sun had gone down blood red and Colonel John Duval slept poorly because of it. The atmosphere on Markin was not normally conducive to blood-red sunsets, though they did happen occasionally on evenings when the blue of sunlight was scattered particularly well. The marks connected red sunsets with approaching trouble. Colonel Duval, who headed the Terran cultural and military mission to Markin, was more cultural than military himself and so was willing to accept the Markin belief that the sunset was a premonition of conflict. He was tall, well-made, and erect in bearing, with the sharp bright eyes and crisp manner of the military man. He successfully tried to project an appearance of authoritative officerhood, and his men respected and feared the image he showed them. His degree was in anthropology, the military education was an afterthought, but a shrewd one. It had brought him command of the Markin outpost. The Department of Extraterrestrial Affairs insisted that all missions to relatively primitive alien worlds be staffed and headed by military men. And, Duval reasoned, so long as I keep up the outward show, who's to know that I'm not the tough soldier they think I am? Markin was a peaceful enough world, the natives were intelligent, fairly highly advanced culturally, if not technically, easily dealt with on a rational being-to-being -being basis. Which explains why Duval slept badly the night of the red sun. Despite his elegant posture and comportment, he regarded himself essentially as a bookish, unmilitary man. He had some doubts as to his own possible behaviour in an unforeseen time of crisis. The false front of his officerhood might well crumble away under stress, and he knew it. He dozed off, finally, toward morning, having kicked the covers to the floor and twisted the sheets into crumpled confusion. It was a warmish night, most of them were on Markin, but he felt chilled. He woke late, only a few minutes before officers' mess, and dressed hurriedly in order to get there on time. As commanding officer, of course, he had the privilege of sleeping as late as he pleased, but getting up with the others was part of the task Deval imposed on himself. He donned the light summer uniform, slapped Depolator hastily on his tanned face, hooked on his formal blaster and belt, and signalled to his orderly that he was awake and ready. The Terran enclave covered ten acres, half an hour's drive from one of the largest Markin villages. An idling jeep waited outside Deval's small private dome, and he climbed in, nodding curtly at the orderly. "'Morning, Harris.' "'Good morning, sir. Sleep well?' It was a ritual by now. "'Very well,' Deval responded automatically as the jeep's turbos thrummed once and sent the little car humming across the compound to the mess hall. Clipped to the seat next to Duval was his daily morning programme sheet, prepared for him by the staffman of the day, while he slept. This morning's sheet was signed by Dudley, a major of formidable efficiency, space service through and through, a military wing career man, and nothing else. Duval scanned the assignments for the morning, neatly written out in Dudley's crabbed hand. Kelly, Dorfman, Mellers, Steber, on linguistic detail, as usual. Same assignment as yesterday, in town. Haskell, on medic duty, blood samples, urinalysis. Matsuoko, to maintenance staff, through Wednesday. Jolly, on zoo detail. Leonard's, Mayor, Rodriguez, on assigned botanical field trip. Two days, extra jeep assigned for specimen collection. Duval scanned the rest of the list, but, as expected, Dudley had done a perfect job of deploying the men where they would be most useful and most happy. Duval thought briefly about Leonard's on the botanical field trip. 
a two-day trip might take them through the dangerous rainforest to the south. Duval felt a faint flicker of worry. The boy was his nephew, his sister's son a reasonably competent journeyman botanist with a gold bar still untarnished on his shoulder. This was the boy's first commission. He had been assigned to Duval's unit at random, as a new man. Duval had concealed his relationship to Leonard's from the other men, knowing it might make things awkward for the boy, but he still felt a protective urge. Hell, the kid can take care of himself, Duval thought and scribbled his initials at the bottom of the sheet, and clipped it back in place. It would be posted while the men were cleaning their quarters, and the officers ate, and by 0900 everyone would be out on his day's assignment. There was so much to do, Duval thought, and so little time to do it. There were so many worlds. He quitted the jeep, and entered the mess hall. Officers' mess was a small well-lit alcove to the left of the main hall, as Duval entered, he saw seven men standing stiffly at attention, waiting for him. He knew they hadn't been standing that way all morning. They had snapped to attention only when their lookout, probably Second Lieutenant Leonard's, the youngest, had warned them he was coming. Well, he thought, it doesn't matter much, as long as appearance is preserved, the form. Good morning, gentlemen, he said crisply and took his place at the head of the table. For a while, it looked as if it were going to turn out a pretty good day. The sun rose in a cloudless sky, and the thermometer tacked to the enclave flagstaff registered 93 degrees. When Markin got hot, it got hot. By noon, Duval knew by now, they could expect something like 110 in the shade, and then a slow, steady decline into the low eighties by midnight. The botanical crew departed on time, rumbling out of camp in its two jeeps, and Duval stood for a moment on the mess hall steps watching them go, watching the other men head for their assigned posts. Stubble-faced Sergeant Jolly saluted him as he trotted across the compound to the Sioux, where he would tend the little menagerie of Markin wildlife the expedition would bring back to earth at termination. Wiry little Matsuoko passed by, dragging a carpenter's kit. The linguistic team climbed into its jeep and drove off toward town, where they would continue their studies in the Markin Tanang. They were all busy. The expedition had been on Markin just four months. Eight months was left of their time. Unless an extension of stay came through, they'd pack up and return to Earth for six months of furlough come report session and then it would be on to some other world for another year of residence. Duval was not looking forward to leaving Markin. It was a pleasant world, if a little on the hot side, and there was no way of knowing what the next world would be like. A frigid ball of frozen methane, perhaps, where they would spend their year bundled into Valdez breathing suits and trying to make contact with some species of intelligent ammonia-breathing mollusks. Better the devil we know, Duval felt. But he had to keep moving on. This was his eleventh world, and there would be more to come. Earth had barely enough qualified survey teams to cover ten thousand worlds half adequately, and life abounded on ten million. He would retain whichever members of the current team satisfied him by their performance, replace those who didn't fit in, and go off on his next job eight months from now. He turned on the office fan and took down the logbook, and fastening the binder, he slipped the first blank sheet into the autotype. For once he avoided his standard blunder. He cleared his throat before switching on the autotype, thereby sparing the machine its customary difficulties in finding a verbal equivalent for his <coughs> The guide light glowed a soft red, Duval said. 4th April, 2705, Colonel John F. Duval recording. 119th day of our stay on Markin, World 7 of System 1106 Sub A. Temperature, 93 at 0900. Wind gentle, southerly. He went on at considerable length, 
as he did each morning. Finishing off the required details, he gathered up the sheaf of specialty reports that had been left at his door the night before, and began to read abstracts into the log. The autotype clattered merrily, and a machine somewhere in the basement of the towering E.T. Affairs building in Rio de Janeiro was reproducing his words as the sub-radio hookup transmitted them. It was dull work. Duval often wondered whether he might have been ultimately happier doing simple anthropological fieldwork, as he had once done, instead of taking on the onerous burden of routine that an administrative post entailed. But someone has to shoulder the burden, he thought. Earthman's burden. We're the most advanced race. We help the others. But no one twists our arms to come out to these worlds and share what we have. Call it an inner compulsion. He intended to work until noon. In the afternoon, a Markin high priest was coming to the enclave to see him, and the interview would probably take almost till sundown. But about eleven hundred, he was interrupted suddenly by the sound of jeeps unexpectedly entering the compound, and he heard the clamour of voices, both Terran voices and alien ones. A fearful argument seemed to be in progress, but the group was too far away, and Deval's knowledge of Markin too uncertain for him to be able to tell what was causing the rumpus. In some annoyance, he snapped off the autotype, rose from his chair, and peered through the window into the yard. Two jeeps had drawn up, the botanical crew gone less than two hours. Four natives surrounded the three earthmen. Two of the natives clutched barbed spears. A third was a woman, the fourth an old man. They were all protesting hotly over something. Duval scowled. From the pale, tense, unhappy faces of the men in the jeep, he could tell something was very wrong. That blood-red sunset had foretold accurately, he thought, as he dashed down the steps from his study. Seven pairs of eyes focused on him as he strode toward the group, eight glittering alien eyes, warmly golden, and six shifting, uneasy Terran eyes. "'What's going on out here?' Duval demanded. The aliens set up an immediate babble of noise, chattering away like a quartet of squirrels. Duval had never seen any of them behaving this way before. "'Quiet!' he roared. In the silence that followed, he said very softly, "'Lieutenant Leonards, can you tell me exactly what all this fuss is about?' The boy looked very frightened. His jaws were stiffly clenched, his lips bloodless. Y "'Yes, sir,' he said stammeringly. "'Begging your pardon, sir, I seem to have killed an alien.' In the relative privacy of his office, Duval faced them all again, Leonard's sitting very quietly staring at his gleaming boots, Maya and Rodriguez, who had accompanied him on the ill-starred botanizing journey. The aliens were outside. There would be time to calm them down later. Okay, Duval said. Leonard's, I wanted to repeat the story exactly as you just told it to me, and I'll get it down on the autotype. Start talking when I point to you. He switched on the autotype and said, Testimony of Second Lieutenant Paul Leonard's botanist, delivered in presence of Commanding Officer on 4 April 2705. He jabbed a forefinger at Leonard's. The boy's face looked waxy. Beads of sweat dotted his pale, vein-traced forehead, and his blonde hair was tangled and twisted. He clamped his lips together in an agonised grimace, scratched the back of one hand, and finally said, "'Well, we left the enclave about 0900 this morning, bound south and westerly on a tour of the outlying regions. Our purpose was to collect botanical specimens. I was in charge of the group, which also included Sergeants Meyer and Rodriguez.' He paused. "'We... We accomplished little in the first half hour. This immediate area had already been thoroughly covered by us anyway. But about 0945, Maya noticed a heavily wooded area not far to the left of the main road, and called it to my attention. I suggested we stop and investigate. 
It was impossible to penetrate the wooded area in our jeeps, so we proceeded on foot. I left Rodriguez to keep watch over our gear while we were gone. We made our way through a close-packed stand of the deciduous angiosperm trees of a species we had already studied, and found ourselves in a secluded area of natural growth, including several species which we could see were previously uncatalogued. We found one in particular, a shrub consisting of a single thick succulent green stalk perhaps four feet high, topped by a huge golden green composite flower head. We filmed it in detail, took scent samples, pollen prints, and removed several leaves. Duval broke in suddenly. You didn't pick the flower itself? Duval speaking. Of course not. It was the only specimen in the vicinity, and it's not our practice to destroy single specimens for the sake of collecting. But I did remove several leaves from the stalk, and the moment I did that, a native sprang at me from behind a thick clump of ferns. He was armed with one of those notched spears, Maya saw him first and yelled, and I jumped back just as the alien came charging forward with his spear. I managed to deflect the spear with the outside of my arm and was not hurt. The alien fell back a few feet and shouted something at me in his language, which I don't understand too well as yet. Then he raised his spear and menaced me with it. I was carrying the standard-issue radio blaster. I drew it and ordered him in his own language to lower his spear, that we meant no harm. He ignored me and charged a second time. I fired in self-defence, trying to destroy the spear or at worst wound his arm, but he spun round to take the full force of the charge and died instantly. Leonard's shrugged. That's about it, sir. We came back here instantly. Hmm. Duval speaking. Sergeant Meyer, would you say this account is substantially true? Meyer was a thin-faced, dark-haired man who was usually smiling. But he wasn't smiling now. This is Sergeant Meyer. I say that Lieutenant Leonard told the story substantially as it occurred, except that the alien didn't seem overly fierce despite his actions, in my opinion. I myself thought he was bluffing both times he charged, and I was a little surprised when Lieutenant Leonard shot him. That's all, sir. Frowning, the Colonel said, Duval speaking. This has been testimony in the matter of the alien killed today by Lieutenant Leonard's. He snapped off the autotype, stood up, and leaned forward across the desk, staring sternly at the trio of young botanists facing him. These next few days are going to be my test, he thought tensely. Sergeant Rodriguez, since you weren't present at the actual incident, I'll consider you relieved of all responsibility in this matter and your testimony won't be required. Report to Major Dudley for reassignment for the remainder of the week. Thank you, sir, Rodriguez saluted, grinned gratefully, and was gone. As for you two, though, Duval said heavily, you'll both have to be confined to base pending the outcome of the affair. I don't need to tell you how serious this can be, whether the killing was in self-defence or not. Plenty of peoples don't understand the concept of self-defence. He moistened his suddenly dry lips. I don't anticipate too many complications growing out of this, but these are alien people on an alien world, and their behaviour is never certain. He glanced at Leonard's. Lieutenant, I'll have to ask for your own safety that you remain in your quarters until further notice. Yes, sir. Is this to be considered a rest? Not yet, Duval said. Maya, attach yourself to the maintenance platoon for the remainder of the day. We'll probably need your testimony again before this business is finished. Dismissed, both of you. When they were gone, Duval sank back limply in his web-phone chair and stared at his fingertips. His hands were quivering as if they had a life of their own. John F. Duval, PhD Anthropology, Columbia 82. Commissioned Space Service Military Wing 87, and now you're in trouble for the first time. How are you going to handle it, Jack? He asked himself. Can you prove that that silver eagle really belongs on your shoulder? He was sweating. He felt very tired. He shut his eyes for a moment, opened them, and said into the intercom, Send in the marks. Five of them entered, 
made ceremonial bows, and ranged themselves nervously along the far wall as if they were firing squad candidates. Accompanying them came Steber of the linguistics team, hastily recalled from town to serve as an interpreter for Duval. The colonel's knowledge of Markin was adequate but sketchy. He wanted Steber around in case any fine points had to be dealt with in detail. The marks were humanoid in structure, simian in ancestry, which should have made them close kin to the Terrans in general physiological structure. They weren't. Their skin was a rough, coarse, pebble-grained affair, dark-toned, running to muddy browns and occasional deep purples. Their jaws had somehow acquired a reptilian hinge in the course of evolution, which left them practically chinless, but capable of swallowing food in huge lumps that would strangle an earthman. Their eyes, liquid gold in colour, were set wide on their heads, allowing enormous peripheral vision. Their noses were flat buttons, in some cases barely perceptible. Deval saw two younger men, obviously warriors. They had left their weapons outside, but their jaws jutted belligerently, and the darker of the pair had virtually dislocated his jaw in rage. The woman looked like all the Mark women, shapeless and weary behind her shabby cloak of furs. The remaining pair were priests, one old, one very old. It was this ancient to whom Duval addressed his first remarks. "'I'm sorry that our meeting this afternoon has to be one of sorrow.' I had been looking forward to a pleasant talk. But it's not always possible to predict what lies ahead. Death lay ahead for him who was killed, the old priest said in the dry, high-pitched tone of voice that Deval knew implied anger and scorn. The woman let out a sudden wild ululation, half a dozen wailing words jammed together so rapidly Deval could not translate them. "'What did she say?' he asked Steber. The interpreter flattened his palms together thoughtfully. "'She's the woman of the man who was killed. "'She was demanding revenge,' he said in English. "'Apparently the two young warriors were friends of the dead man. "'Deval's eyes scanned the five hostile alien faces. "'This is a highly regrettable incident,' he said in Markin but I trust it won't affect the warm relationship between Earthman and Markin that has prevailed so far. This misunderstanding... Blood must be atoned, said the smaller and less impressively garbed of the two priests. He was probably the local priest, Deval thought, and was probably happy to have his superior on hand to back him up. The colonel flicked sweat from his forehead. The young man who committed the act will certainly be disciplined. Of course you realise that a killing in self-defence cannot be regarded as murder, but I admit the young man did act unwisely and will suffer the consequences. It didn't sound too satisfying to Duval, and indeed the aliens hardly seemed impressed. The high priest uttered two short, sharp syllables. They were not words in Duval's vocabulary and he looked over at Steber in appeal. He said Leonard's was trespassing on sacred ground. He said the crime they're angry about is not murder, but blasphemy. Despite the heat, Deval felt a sudden chill. Not murder? This is going to be complicated, he realised gloomily. To the priest, he said, does this change the essential nature of the case? He'll still be punished by us for his action, which can't be condoned. You may punish him for murder, if you so choose, the high priest said, speaking very slowly so Duval could understand each word. The widow emitted some highly terrestrial-sounding sobs. The young man glowered stolidly. Murder is not our concern the high priest went on. He has taken life. Life belongs to them, and they withdraw it whenever they see fit, by whatever means they care to employ. 
but he has also desecrated a sacred flower on sacred ground. These are serious crimes to us. Added to this, he has shed the blood of a guardian on sacred ground. We ask you to turn him over to us for trial by a priestly court on this double charge of blasphemy. Afterward, perhaps, you may try him by your own laws, for whichever one of them he has broken. For an instant all Deval saw was the old priest's implacable leathery face. Then he turned and caught the expression of white-faced astonishment and dismay Steber displayed. It took several seconds for the high priest's words to sink in, and several more before Deval came to stunned realization of the implications. They want to try an earthman, he thought numbly, by their own law, in their own court, and mete out their own punishment. This had abruptly ceased being a mere local incident, an affair to clean up, note in the log, and forget. It was no longer a matter of simple reparations for the accidental killing of an alien. Now, thought Deval dully, it was a matter of galactic importance. And he was the man who had to make all the decisions. He visited Leonard's that evening, after the meal. By that time everyone in the camp knew what had happened, though Duval had ordered Steber to keep quiet about the alien demand to try Leonard's themselves. The boy looked up as Duval entered his room, and managed a soggy salute. At ease, Lieutenant, Duval sat on the edge of Leonard's bed and squinted up at him. "'Son, you're in very hot water now. Sir, I—' "'I know. You didn't mean to pluck leaves off the sacred bramble-bush, and you couldn't help shooting down the native who attacked you. And if this business were as simple as all that, I'd reprimand you for hot-headedness and let it go at that. But—' "'But what, sir?' Deval scowled and forced himself to face the boy squarely. "'But the aliens want to try you themselves. "'They aren't so much concerned with the murder "'as they are with your double act of blasphemy. "'That withered old high priest "'wants to take you before an ecclesiastical court. "'You won't allow that, of course, will you, Colonel?' "'Leonard seemed confident that such an unthinkable thing "'could never happen. "'I'm not so sure, Paul,' Duval said quietly deliberately using the boy's first name. "'What, sir?' "'This is evidently something very serious you have committed. That high priest is calling a priestly convocation to deal with you. They'll be back here to get you tomorrow at noon,' he said. "'But you wouldn't turn me over to them, sir. After all, I was on duty. I had no knowledge of the offence I was committing. Why, it's none of their business.' "'Make them see that,' Duval said flatly. "'They're aliens. They don't understand Terran legal codes. They don't want to hear about our laws. By theirs you've blasphemed, and blasphemers must be punished. This is a law-abiding race on Markin. They're an ethically advanced society, regardless of the fact that they're not technologically advanced. Ethically, they're on the same plane we are.' Leonard's looked terribly pale. "'You'll turn me over to them?' Deval shrugged. "'I didn't say that, but look at it from my position. "'I'm leader of a cultural and military mission. "'Our purpose is to live among these people, learn their ways, "'guide them as much as we can in our limited time here. "'We at least try to make a pretense of respecting their rights "'as individuals and as a species, you know. "'Well, now it's squarely on the line.' Are we friends living among them and helping them, or are we overlords grinding them under our thumbs? Sir, I'd say that was an oversimplification, Leonard's remarked hesitantly. Maybe so, but the issue's clear enough. If we turn them down, it means we're setting up a gulf of superiority between Earth and these aliens, despite the big show we made about being brothers. And word will spread to other planets. 
we try to sound like friends, but our actions in the celebrated Leonard's case reveal our true colours. We are arrogant, imperialistic, patronising, and, well, do you see? So you're going to turn me over to them for trial, then, the boy said quietly. Deval shook his head. He felt old, very old, at fifty. I don't know. I haven't made up my mind yet. If I turn you over, it'll certainly set a dangerous precedent. And if I don't, I'm not sure what will happen. He shrugged. I'm going to refer the case back to Earth. It isn't my decision to make. But it was his decision to make, he thought, as he left the boys' quarters and headed stiff-legged toward the communications shack. He was on the spot, and only he could judge the complex of factors that controlled the case. Earth would almost certainly pass the buck back to him. He was grateful for one thing, though. At least Leonard's hadn't made an appeal to him on family grounds. That was cause for pride, and some relief. The fact that the boy was his nephew was something he'd have to blot rigorously from his mind until all this was over. The signalman was busy in the back of the shack, bent over a crowded work table. Duval waited a moment, cleared his throat gently, and said, "'Mr. Rory?' Rory turned. "'Yes, Colonel? Put through a sub-radio solido to Earth for me, immediately. To Director Thornton at the E.T. Department. And yell for me when you've made contact.' It took twenty minutes for the subspace impulse to leap out across the light years and find a receiver on Earth, ten minutes more for it to pass through the relay point and on to Rio. Deval returned to the shack to find the lambent green Solido field in tune and waiting for him. He stepped through and discovered himself standing a few feet before the desk of the E.T. department's head. Thornton's image was sharp but the desk seemed to waver at the edges. Solid, non-organic objects always came through poorly. Quickly, Deval reviewed the situation. Thornton sat patiently, unmoving, till the end of it. Hands knotted rigidly, lean face set. He might have been a statue. Finally, he commented, Unpleasant business. Quiet. The alien is returning tomorrow, you say? I'm afraid that doesn't give us much time to hold a staff meeting and explore the problem, Colonel Deval. I could probably delay him a few days. Thornton's thin lips formed a tight, bloodless line. After an instant he said, No. Take whatever action you deem necessary, Colonel. If the psychological pattern of the race is such that unfortunate consequences would result if you refuse to allow them to try your man, then you must certainly turn him over. If the step can be avoided, of course, avoid it. The man must be punished in any case. The director smiled bleakly. You're one of our best men, Colonel. I'm confident you'll arrive at an ultimately satisfactory resolution to this incident. Thank you, sir. Deval said in a dry, uncertain voice. He nodded and stepped back out of the field range. Thornton's image seemed to flicker. Deval caught one last dismissing sentence. Report back to me when the matter is settled. And then the field died. He stood alone in the shabby communications shack, blinking out the sudden darkness that rolled in over him after the solidophone's intense light and after a moment began to pick his way over to the heaps of equipment and out into the compound. It was as he had expected. Thornton was a good man, but he was a civilian appointee, subject to government control. He disliked making top-level decisions, particularly when a colonel a few hundred light-years away could be pitchforked into making them for him. Well, he thought, at least I notified Earth. The rest of the affair is in my hands. Significantly, there was a red sunset again that night. 
He called a meeting of his top staff men for 0915 the following morning. Work at the base had all but suspended. The linguistics team was confined to the area, and Duval had ordered guards posted at all exits. Violence could rise unexpectedly among even the most placid of alien peoples. It was impossible to predict the moment when a racial circuit-breaker would cease to function and fierce hatred burst forth. They listened in silence to the tapes of Leonard's statements, Meyer's comments, and the brief interview Duval had had with the five aliens. Duval punched the cut-off stud and glanced rapidly round the table at his men. Two majors, a captain, and a quarter of lieutenants comprised his high staff, and one of the lieutenants was confined to quarters. That's the picture. The old high priest is showing up here about noon for my answer. I thought I'd toss the thing open for staff discussion first. Major Dudley asked for the floor. He was a short, stocky man with dark, flashing eyes, and on several occasions in the past had been known to disagree violently with Duval on matters of procedure. Duval had picked him for four successive trips, despite this. The colonel believed in diversity of opinion, and Dudley was a tremendously efficient organiser as well. Major! Sir, it doesn't seem to me that there's any question of what action to take. It's impossible to hand Leonard's over to them for trial. It's unearthlike. Duval frowned. Would you elaborate, Major? Simple enough. We're the race who developed the space drive. Therefore, we're the galaxy's most advanced race. I think that goes without saying. It does not, Duval commented, but go ahead. Scowling, Dudley said. Regardless of your opinion, sir, the aliens we've encountered so far have all regarded us as their obvious superiors. I don't think that can be denied, and I think it can only be attributed to the fact that we are their superiors. Well, if we give up Leonard's for trial, it cheapens our position. It makes us look weak, spineless. We— You're suggesting, then, Duval broke in, that we hold the position of overlords in the galaxy— and by yielding to our serfs, we may lose all control over them. Is this your belief, Major? Duval glared at him. Dudley met the Colonel's angry gaze calmly. Basically, yes, damn it, sir. I've tried to make you see this ever since the Hegath expedition. We're not out here in the stars to collect butterflies and squirrels. We— Out of order, Duval snapped coldly. This is a cultural mission as well as military, Major and so long as I'm in command it remains primarily cultural. He felt on the verge of losing his temper. He glanced away from Dudley and said, Major Gray, could I hear from you? Gray was the ship's astrogator. On land his functions were to supervise stockade construction and map mating. He was a wiry, unsmiling little man with razor-like cheekbones and ruddy skin. I feel we have to be cautious, sir. Handing Lenin's over would result in a tremendous loss of Terran prestige. Loss? Dudley burst in. It would cripple us! We'd never be able to hold our heads up honestly in the galaxy again if— Calmly, Deval said. Major Dudley, you've been ruled out of order. Leave this meeting, Major. I'll discuss a downward revision of your status with you later. Turning back to Grey without a further glance at Dudley, he said— you don't believe, Major, that such an action would have a corresponding favourable effect on our prestige in the eyes of these worlds inclined to regard Earth uneasily? That's an extremely difficult thing to determine, sir. Very well, then, Duval rose. Pursuant to regulations, I brought this matter to the attention of authorities on Earth, and I've also offered it for open discussion among my officers. Thanks for your time, gentlemen. Captain Marichal said uncertainly, "'Sir, won't there be any vote on our intended course of action?' Duval grinned coldly. "'As commanding officer of this base, I'll take the sole responsibility upon myself for the decision in this particular matter. It may make things easier for all of us in the consequent event of a court-martial inquiry.' It was the only way, he thought, as he waited tensely in his office for the high priest to arrive. 
the officers seemed firmly set against any conciliatory action in the name of Terra's prestige. It was hardly fair for him to make them take responsibility for a decision that might be repugnant to them. Too bad about Dudley, Deval mused, but insubordination of that sort was insufferable. Dudley would have to be dropped from the unit on the next trip out. If there is any next trip out for me, he added. The intercom glowed gently. Yes? Alien delegation is here, sir, said the orderly. Don't send them in until I signal. He strode to the window and looked out. The compound at first glance seemed full of aliens. Actually, there were only a dozen, he realised, but they were clad in full panoply, bright red and harsh green robes, carrying spears and ornamental swords. Half a dozen enlisted men were watching them nervously from a distance, their hands ready to fly to blasters instantly, if necessary. He weighed the choices one last time. If he handed Leonard's over, the temporary anger of the aliens would be appeased, but perhaps at a long-range cost to Earth's prestige. Duval had long regarded himself as an essentially weak man with a superb instinct for camouflage, but would his yielding to the aliens imply to the universe that all Earth was weak? On the other hand, he thought, suppose he refused to release Leonard's to the aliens? Then he would be, in essence, bringing down the overlord's thumb, letting the universe know that Earthmen were responsible only to themselves and not to the peoples the worlds they visit. Either way, he realised, the standing of Earth in the galaxy's estimation would suffer. One way, they would look like appeasing weaklings, the other like tyrants. He remembered a definition he had once read, Melodrama is the conflict of right and wrong. Tragedy is the conflict of right and right. Both sides were right here. Whichever way he turned, there would be difficulties. And there was an additional factor. The boy. What if they executed him? Family considerations seemed absurdly picayune at this moment, but still... To hand his own nephew over for possible execution by an alien people? He took a deep breath, straightened his shoulders, sharpened the hard gaze of his eyes. A glance at the mirror over the bookcase told him he looked every inch the commanding officer, not a hint of the inner conflict showed through. He depressed the intercom stud. Send in the high priest, let the rest of them wait outside. The priest looked impossibly tiny and wrinkled, a gnome of a man whose skin was fantastically gullied and mazed by extreme age. He wore a green turban over his hairless head, a mark of deep mourning, Deval knew. The little alien bowed low, extending his pipe-stem arms behind his back at a sharp angle, indicating respect. When he straightened, his head craned back sharply, his small round eyes peering directly into Duval's. "'The jury has been selected. The trial is ready to begin. Where is the boy?' Duval wished fleetingly he could have had the services of an interpreter for this last interview. But that was impossible. This was something he had to face alone, without help. The accused man is in his quarters, Deval said slowly. First, I want to ask some questions, old one. Ask. If I give you the boy to try, will there be any chance of his receiving the death penalty? It is conceivable, Deval scowled. Can't you be a little more definite than that? How can we know the verdict before the trial takes place? Let that pass, Duval said, seeing he would get no concrete reply. Where would you try him? 
not far from here. Could I be present at the trial? No. Duval had learned enough of Markin grammar by now to realise that the form of the negative the priest had employed meant literally, I say no and mean what I say. Moistening his lips, he said, Suppose I should refuse to turn Lieutenant Lennons over to you for trial. How could I expect you people to react? There was a long silence. Finally the old priest said, Would you do such a thing? I'm speaking hypothetically. Literally, the form was, I speak on a cloud. It would be very bad. We would be unable to purify the sacred garden for many months. Also, he added a sentence of unfamiliar words. Duval puzzled unsuccessfully over their meaning for a nearly a minute. What does that mean? he asked at length. Phrase it in different words. It is the name of a ritual. I would have to stand trial in the earthman's place. And I would die, the priest said simply. Then my successor would ask you all to go away. The office seemed very quiet. The only sounds Duval heard were the harsh breathing of the old priest and the off-key chirruping of the cricket-like insects that infested the grass plot outside the window. Appeasement, he wondered, or the overlord's thumb. Suddenly there seemed no doubt at all in his mind of what he should do, and he wondered how he could have hesitated. I hear and respect your wishes, old man, he said, in a ritual formula of renunciation Steber had taught him. The boy is yours, but can I ask a favour? Ask. He didn't know he was offending your laws. He meant well. He is sincerely sorry for what he did. He is in your hands now, but I want to ask mercy on his behalf. He had no way of knowing he was offending. This will be seen at the trial, the old priest said coldly. If there is to be mercy, mercy will be shown him. I make no promises. Very well, Duval said. He reached for a pad and scrawled an order demanding Lieutenant Paul Leonard's to the aliens for trial, and signed it with his full name and title. Here, give this to the earthman who let you in. He'll see to it that the boy is turned over to you. You are wise, the priest said. He bowed elaborately and made for the door. Just one moment, Duval said desperately as the alien opened the door. Another question. Ask, the priest said. You told me you'd take his place if I refused to let you have him. Well, how about another substitute? Suppose... You are not acceptable to us, the priest said as if reading Duval's mind, and left. Five minutes later, the colonel glanced out his window and saw the solemn procession of aliens passing through the exit posts and out of the compound. In their midst, unprotesting, was Leonard's. He didn't look back, and Duval was glad of it. The colonel stared at the row of books a long time, the frayed spools that had followed him around from world to world, from grey Danelon to stormy Lurin to bone-dry Corval, and on to Hegath and Mqualt and the others, and now to warm blue-skied Markin. Shaking his head, he turned away and dropped heavily into the foam cradle behind his desk. He snapped on the autotype with a savage gesture and dictated a full account of his actions, from the very start until his climactic decision, and smiled bitterly. There would be a certain time lag, but before long the autotype facsimile machine in the ET department's basement would start clacking there in Rio, and Thornton would know what Duval had done and Thornton would be stuck with it as department policy henceforth. Duval switched on the intercom and said, 
I am not to be disturbed under any circumstances. If there's anything urgent, have it sent to Major Gray. He's acting head of the base until I countermand. And if any messages come from Earth, let Gray have them too. He wondered if they'd relieve him of his command immediately, or wait until he got back to Earth. The latter more likely. Thornton had some subtlety, if not much. But there was certain to be an inquiry, and a head would roll. Duval shrugged and stretched back. I did what was right, he told himself firmly. That's the one thing I can be sure of. But I hope I don't ever have to face my sister again. He dozed after a while, eyes half open and slipping rapidly closed. Sleep came to him, and he welcomed it, for he was terribly tired. He was awakened suddenly by a loud outcry, a jubilant shout from a dozen throats at once, splitting the afternoon calm. Duval felt a moment's disorientation, then, awakening rapidly, he sprang to the window and peered out. A figure, alone and on foot, was coming through the open gateway. He wore regulation uniform, but it was dripping wet and torn in several places. His blonde hair was plastered to his scalp as if he had been swimming. He looked fatigued. Leonard's. The colonel was nearly halfway out the front door before he realised that his uniform was in improper order. He forced himself back, tidied his clothing and with steely dignity strode out the door a second time. Leonard stood surrounded by a smiling knot of men, enlisted men and officers alike. The boy was grinning wearily. "'Attention!' Duval barked, and immediately the area fell silent. He stepped forward. Leonard raised one arm in an exhausted salute. There were some ugly bruises on him. I'm back, Colonel. I'm aware of that. You understand I'll have to return you to the marks for trial anyway, despite your no doubt daring escape? The boy smiled and shook his head. No, sir, you don't follow, sir. The trial's over. I've been tried and acquitted. What's that? It was trial by ordeal, Colonel. They prayed for half an hour or so, and then they dumped me in the lake down the road. The dead man's two brothers came after me and tried to drown me, but I outswam them and came up safely on the other side. He shook his hair like a drenched cat, scattering a spray of water several feet in the air. They nearly had me once, but as soon as I got across the lake alive and undrowned, it proved to them that I couldn't have meant any harm. So they declared me innocent, apologised, and turned me loose. They were still praying when I left them. There seemed to be no bitterness in Leonard's attitude. Apparently, Duval thought, he had understood the reason for the decision to hand him over, and would not hold it against him now. That was gratifying. "'You'd better get to your quarters and dry off, Lieutenant, and then come to my office. I'd like to talk to you there.' "'Yes, sir.' Duval spun sharply and headed back across the clearing to his office. He slammed the door behind him and switched on the autotype. The report to Earth would have to be amended now. A moment or two after he had finished, the intercom glowed. He turned it on and heard Stebber's voice saying, "'Sir, the old priest is here. He wants to apologise to you for everything. He's wearing clothing of celebration, and he brought a peace offering for us.' "'Tell him I'll be right out,' Duval said, "'and call all the men together, including Dudley, especially Dudley. I want him to see this.' He slipped off his sweat-stained jacket and took a new one out. Surveying himself in the mirror, he nodded approvingly. "'Well, well,' he thought, "'so the boy came through it safely. That's good.' But he knew that the fate of Paul Leonard's had been irrelevant all along, except on the sheerly personal level. It was the larger issue that counted. For the first time... Earth had made a concrete demonstration of the equality of intelligent life doctrine that had been preaching so long. He had shown that he respected the Markin laws in terms of what they were to the Marks, and he had won the affection of a race as a result. Having the boy return unharmed 
was a bonus. But the precedent had been set, and the next time, perhaps, on some other world, the outcome might not be so pleasant. Some cultures had pretty nasty ways of putting criminals to death. He realised that the burden the Earth exploration teams carried now had become many times heavier, that now Earthmen would be subject to the laws of the planets who hosted them, and no more unwitting botanical excursions into sacred gardens could be tolerated. But it was for the ultimate good, he thought. We've shown them that we're not overlords, and that most of us don't want to be overlords. And now the thumb comes down on us. He opened the door and stepped out. The men had gathered, and the old priest knelt abjectly at the foot of the steps, bearing some sort of enamelled box as his offering. Deval smiled and returned the bow, and lifted the old alien gently to his feet. We'll have to be on our best behaviour from now on, he thought. We'll really have to watch our steps, but it'll be worth it.